You're listening to the Sermon Podcast for the Peak Church, located in Apex, North Carolina. Our church is striving to welcome all who are feeling disconnected from God. And so our hope is that over the next several minutes, you will connect with the God that we are talking about, and you'll resonate deeply with the life that this God wants for you. We hope you enjoy. Well, let me uh, start off with a quick word of gratitude. Uh, thanks to Pastor Kyle and uh, Pastor Amanda for letting me be here and to be here with you all this morning. And thanks to you for, for joining us for this hour of worship. Uh, during the season of November, I'm also trying to practice gratitude um, in unsuspecting places. So let me give a huge shout out to the tech team for, um, for all that they do and this microphone. Uh, Sounds weird. I'm a person that uses their hands to preach and communicate in general. So when Julie told me this morning that I would be using a handheld mic, it's like asking me to speak out of like the left side hand side of my mouth. Like it just it wasn't going to work. Um, but then I remember watching Kyle preach, and I realized you have a pastor who doesn't just use his hands to preach, uses his entire body to preach. Um, I, I, I burn calories watching online uh, just Kyle preach, and so um, I, if Kyle can do it then to be sure, uh, I can do it, is use a handheld mic. Uh, so thanks to you all, uh, thanks to the tech team, thanks to everybody who's been so hospitable and welcoming me to this space. But most of all, thank you uh, that we've gathered together to worship God. Before we dive into this uh, text this morning, will you join me in a quick word of prayer? Let's pray. Oh, gracious God, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Whether that path is in the peak, or the path is in the valley, on the sunny side of the street, or in the darker times of life. It's your word that draws us near to you. Might that be true this day? In your son's name we pray. Amen. So about 13 years ago, there was a YouTube video that became a sensation, and I can guarantee you that most of you, if you are older than the age of 13, have seen this video at some point. It was a video of an audition that took place on Britain's Got Talent, and it was a woman who came from a small Scottish village in the middle of nowhere, Scotland, and she came up to the stage, and she trounced onto the stage, and she stood there in the middle, kind of in her, her disheveled and stodgy look, and it was at that moment that the world was introduced to Susan Boyle. If you haven't watched this video, let me encourage you to YouTube it after the service. Um, it is her audition for Britain's Got Talent. And when she walked onto that stage, there was almost a collective eye roll among the people that were in that auditorium because she didn't look the part. Not only that, but she walked out there and she had a little bit of an, uh, an aloof nature to her. She was standing there speaking with some of the, the, the judges, the three judges who were all intimidating characters, and she almost just didn't feel like she had the stage composure. But then she opened her mouth. And she began to sing one of the famous songs, the, the famous song of lament from that beautiful musical Les Mis. The song is called I Dreamed a Dream. And it says, I dreamed a dream in time gone by when hope was high and life was worth living. If you've ever seen the play Les Mis before, you, you know where this comes in the story. If you haven't seen it, uh, it's coming back to Deepak, actually, uh, in the next couple of months, so buy tickets. That's not a plug for Deepak, just happen to know that. Um, if you've ever seen the play before, you know where this comes in the play. It's uh, Fantine is, is the actress, or is the, is the character in the story, and she is a young mother who had a child and by life's circumstance had to give up her child, and she's still supporting her from afar. But at this point in the play, she has not only lost her job, she's living on the streets, and she's taken to a career where she has to sell herself in order to make money to pay for her child's well-being. And it's at that point that all of her life's dreams seemed to have flown out the window. She has nothing worth living for anymore other than her distant daughter who she no longer sees. It's a heartbreaking part of the story. I mean, Les Mis is a, it's called Les Mis, The Miserables. I mean, it's a, it's a heartbreaking story just in general. But for this particular woman, it is as if her entire dream of her life 
has been shattered. And she's devastated. The play is quite emotional at this point, and she concludes the song by saying, I had a dream my life would be so different from this hell I'm living, so different now from what it seemed. Now life has killed the dream I dreamed. The song will bring you to tears. Maybe not Anne Hathaway's version of it. It wasn't that great, but if you've seen other versions of it, it's very good. It's a heartbreaking song, but it's a song that's so true. But the interesting thing about Susan Boyle singing that song, when she sang it for Britain's Got Talent, was that she wasn't acting. When you watched Susan Boyle sing that song, it was as if this was her song. Because if you learn a little bit about Susan Boyle, she, she was, it's hard to believe, you won't believe this, she was 47 when she sang that song. She looked like she was 70. She looked like she was disheveled, that she had lived a couple times around the sun, a few more times than most of us had. She looked like she had lost everything, but she was 47. She was single. She had always wanted to be a singer. She had always wanted to make a name for herself, but she had only gotten picked up in parts, probably just because of her disheveled appearance. Um, She had always wanted to sing, but she only was picked up in the local pubs and for little local performances, but she had never made it big. In fact, she had given up on her dream years prior because she had had to go home to take care of her dying mother for three years and just gave up everything to be with her mom, who was 91 and dying. And so here she comes onto the stage. She begins to sing. And she begins to embody this song of lament of a person who has lost their dream. Last week in the sermon series, I know that Pastor Kyle preached on, um, on grief. And he spoke about grief, uh, the grief that we know, the grief that's so common, the grief of losing a loved one. And it was appropriate. It was All Saints Day, a day in which we remember the saints and we, we grieve once again, perhaps, and give thanks to God for those lives that have gone before us, those, that, those lives that are no longer with us but in memory alone. But this week we turn to a different type of grief. A grief, perhaps, that is just as present in our lives, but maybe isn't spoken about as much. The, the grief of losing a dream, of, of losing a vision for ourselves that we, that we once had, a, a, lose, a, a, a grief of a, of a future that we had mapped out perfectly in our five-year plan. This was the way life was supposed to look like. This was the person I thought I'd be by now. This was the person that I thought I would become. Or perhaps this is the person I once was, but I'm no longer. Um, I had a similar experience uh, as Fantine, just not quite as musical and not quite as uh, uh, musically dramatic. Um, uh, it happened actually just a few weeks ago. Um, so a few weeks ago, I signed up for one of the, I did uh, one of the dumbest things I've ever done. And I paid the price for it last week. I signed up for a race a few weeks ago. Now, a little bit of context for you. I, uh, I uh, once described myself as a runner, um, and I enjoyed running. It was a little bit insane, but I would, do, uh, I would do races as much as I could. I had the time for it, had the energy for it, had, the, had the, the, the stature, I guess, for it at the time. And so I would run once a year, try to do a marathon, try to do a half marathon, something that kind of helped me in shape. I once was a runner, and my brain says to me, even now, I'm still a runner. However, a few things have changed in the past 18 months. Number one is my wife and I had our first kid, which means all of that energy I once had is no more. It doesn't happen. It doesn't exist. Two is that I changed careers and my life is a little bit more regimented and structured. I'm over, back over at Duke instead of being in the local church. And so I'm, I'm on campus a lot. And as a result, my time's gone. And three, I hit this fascinating age of 37 where all of a sudden it's like your metabolism comes to a screeching halt and you can no longer uh, just stay in shape. All these things made my life, my mind still saying I'm a runner, but my body said, no, you are not. And so I signed up for this race, and it was a race that was all the way through the night. (laughs) It started at sundown, and it ended at at sunrise. I told the 9 a.m. I had not said that aloud, and I realize now how dumb it sounds (laughs) to say that, and I realize how dumb of a decision it was. So I signed up for this race, and I went, and I did it, and it was for 13, because not only... 
they didn't advertise this, but it was also over daylight savings time. So there was this complicated factor of like, we were supposed to run for 12 and all of a sudden we're running for 13 hours. Um, Curveball. Needless to say, I didn't get through that race. Let me just tell you that. I didn't finish it. Because that life that I once was a runner doesn't exist anymore. It's, it's a life that has, is now in the rear view. It, it's a silly example. It's, it, it's, it's an it's a example that you can laugh at. But the truth of the matter is that for some of us, the life that we once lived, or the dream that we once had, or the vision for ourselves that we once thought would come to fruition is much less of a joking matter. The spouse that we thought we would meet. The child that we thought we would have. The job that we thought might give us fulfillment. The purpose that we thought that we might live into. The direction in our lives that we thought we might somehow find by a certain age. I think that we talk a lot about grief as being just something about losing something from the past, losing a loved one, losing a past, but the reality is is that there is grief in our lives in which we lose the future that we thought we were going to live. It's complicated um, by the society that we lived in. There's, um, we, we don't like to talk about losing our hopes and dreams. We don't like to talk about losing that vision for ourselves or that direction or that fulfillment that we thought we were going to live because there's a little bit of a stigma to, to um, or there's a little bit of an expectation that we live into as people in the West, as Americans, as, as people who are kind of go-getters. And number one is that from an early age... The number one lesson that we learn in school is to pursue your dreams. Is that you can be anything that you possibly want to be. You can be any person that you can possibly. If only you work hard. If only you do your homework. If only you do whatever it takes to get there. And we don't factor in life happening sometimes. Uh, I remember, I've got a 14-month-old. He was here at the early service. Um, and so I will probably go tell my child at some point that he, will, he can be whatever he wants to be. So let me just go ahead and introduce myself. I'm the pot. I'm calling you the kettle black. Uh, I will probably do the same thing. But there's a reality that at some point we never make that correction I was listening to a podcast the other day. Um, it's Adam, the Adam Grant podcast. I love Adam Grant, a uh, big psychology professor over at the Wharton School of Business. And he was interviewing Mark Cuban. You might know Mark Cuban. He owns the Dallas Mavericks. He's a guy on Shark Tank. He's one of those sharks. He's brilliant. He's brutally honest. But one of the things that Adam Grant asked him was, what is the worst piece of advice that you can give someone? Or what is the worst piece of advice that you've ever received? And he said, the worst piece of advice that I've ever received is never give up on your dreams. He said, the reason it's the worst piece of advice that I've ever received is because if that were true at the age of 64, I'd still be trying out for the Dallas Mavericks as opposed to owning them. <laughs> There's a reality to life that at some point there's going to be a dream that we once had that if we're wise, we recognize that perhaps it's not going to happen. The second thing that complicates it for us is that not only does society project us like the ideal life and what it looks like to be successful in this cookie-cutter image of what success and, 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 um, and a good life looks like, but it also gives us a timeline for it. There's an expectation that if you don't hit certain things by a certain time, it ain't going to happen. There was an Instagram post that I saw the other day. That this, is a, this is a gut check. Um, I read it. Uh, perhaps I was just in a darker place with my son who was wide awake in the middle of the night, but I saw this in the middle of the night. Um, and it's the title of the, the Instagram post. You can't see it, but I'll read some of this stuff to you. It says, the ages that you peak at everything. Not the kindest uh, Instagram post. Um, let me read some of them for you. At age seven is when you peak at learning a new language. At age 18 is when you peak at your brain's processing power. Probably true. At age 22 is when you peak at remembering people's names. 100% true. But then this is where it starts to sting a little bit. Age 23 is the peak of life satisfaction. 
Not true for those of us above the age of 23. At age 23 is where you're at the peak of female attractiveness in the eyes of men. Age 26 is the peak of finding a partner for marriage. Age 39, the peak of salary for women. Age 51, uh, the peak of understanding people's emotions. And this is an interesting one. Age 74, the peak of happiness with your body. (laughs) Probably a lot older than we thought it was going to be, to be fair. The reality of it is that society not only kind of tells us that we have to live a certain way, but we also have to hit certain milestones at certain mile markers of life. And what it creates for us is a society in in which as we move past these ages, as we kind of go through life and we hit these milestones, it creates a bunch of people who are upset, who are frustrated, who are lament, who are grieving the fact that life didn't hit these milestones as society told us it should. And perhaps it creates in us a hint of shame. The difference between grieving a loved one who's lost and grieving a dream that is lost is that shame factor. Because society says you could have done it if you had just worked hard enough. If you've ever grieved the loss of the dream, if you've ever grieved the loss of life's plans or how you thought life should be, then I hope that you heard the passage of Scripture read this morning. Because you're in good company. You're in some of the best company. Here's the context for today's passage of Scripture. Um, Peter and Jesus are having a conversation. And up until this point, all of the disciples had been with Jesus, and they had seen some of the most amazing things they had ever seen in their life. They had a front row seat to God at God's best. They had witnessed Jesus heal numerous people with all types of diseases, leprosy. He had healed the uh, uh, the centurion's servant. They had seen Jesus feed 5,000. They had seen Jesus draw crowds to him and do things that they had never seen in their entire life. And quite frankly, they're not sure if they're ever going to see it again. It had been a whirlwind experience, and they had front row seats to see and experience all of this. And their minds are probably just racing about what it is that's going to come next. What the future might hold for them. Just before this passage of scripture that we heard read just a second ago, in fact, it's, it's kind of getting to this amazing moment where Peter finally declares Jesus as the Messiah. It is indeed you. You are Lord. You are Messiah. And for that, Jesus says to Peter, you're going to be my guy. It's with that type of faith and that type of outlook. It's on you whom I'm going to build my church. You're my guy. And you can imagine all of the visions in that moment that Peter had for what the future might look like. What his life might look like. What their combined and shared ministry might look like. And then Jesus crashes and destroys all of his dreams. He says, but guys, there's going to come a day very soon when we're going to go to Jerusalem. And not only is it that they're going to beat me and I'm going to suffer, but they're going to kill me as well. Everything that you thought that was going to, what you thought life was going to look like in our shared ministry together is not going to be what you expect. It's not going to happen. I'm going to die. It's going to end this season of ministry. And so you can imagine why Peter gets so upset hearing this. The title of this little section in Scripture says Peter rebukes Jesus to rebuke someone, to be angry at someone, and to to kind of uh, uh, push back against them and, and, and challenge them. Peter rebukes Jesus, yells at Jesus, yells at God, and says, this can't be true. This isn't going to happen. And what we see Peter going through can kind of be diagnosed. If you've ever read uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and her work on, on the stages of grief, what we can see is Peter's moving through grief. He's being very human. He's being angry, angry, and he has some sense of denial, some sense of depression. He's moving through these phases of grief. 
And the reality of it is, is he's probably not so much grieving the loss of Jesus and once was. He's losing, losing hope for what could have been. If you've ever been in a place where you've lost a dream or a vision for your life, you're in good company. You're with Peter. You're with all of us. There was a book I read a few uh, years ago. I've actually read it multiple times now, and I'm, I'm sure that you have heard of it before. It is a, um, if you haven't read it, let me encourage you to pick it up. It's by a professor over at Duke named Kate Bowler, and she wrote a beautiful book called Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I've Loved. She was a person, she's a, she was a, um, a professor, she still is a professor over at Duke, um, who was diagnosed at 35 with stage 4 cancer, and uh, she, had, she was in the peak of her life. She was in this amazing season of her life where she had finally got, uh, she had published her first book, had been picked up by Duke as a faculty member, she had a young son, a beautiful marriage, everything was going well, and in one diagnosis, her life flashed before her eyes, and she pictured everything that she had hoped for being thrown out the window. And she processes grief throughout this book. It is such a good friend if you are going through grief right now. She processes grief in this way. Um, She has an interesting quote where she said, I used to think that grief was about looking backwards. It was like a bunch of old guys that were saddled with regrets or young ones just pondering all the should-haves. But now now I see that grief is about eyes squinting through tears into an unbearable future. We often think about grief as looking backward. But for some of us, grief is about looking forward and figuring out how it is that we keep moving. The loss of a dream is painful, and in Peter's mind, he's losing everything that he had been present to in this moment. But let me suggest to you that while this passage of Scripture is a really good account that all of us experience grief, let me suggest to you this morning that it offers us three invitations. First invitation, first invitation, it's okay to grieve a lost dream. Society might say, well, it was in your power to do it. Let me tell you that life happens, and not all things are within our power. And it's okay to grieve those things that we lose. Peter, if he is the trusted disciple of Jesus on whom Jesus is about to build his church, then to be sure, if he is angry at Jesus, if he is frustrated, if he's experiencing a sense of grief, then perhaps all of us, all of the human experience, experiences this at some times. It's a feature of our lives. We don't just grieve losing people. We grieve losing visions for the future, the child that we never had the job that never fulfills, the spouse that we never met. The second thing it gives us permission to do is it gives us permission to be angry at God. That might be a controversial thing to say. It might be a controversial to kind of put into the ether. It might be something that you've never heard spoken before, but I would be willing to bet that you've probably felt it before at some point. Peter is angry at God in this moment, frustrated that Jesus is revealing to him something that's not going to happen, something that he envisioned that's just never going to be fulfilled. If you have read the Psalms before, which is another great companion to going through grief in life, you know that there are Psalms in there. There's some beautiful ones about, he leads me beside still waters, and those are great. Those are lovely. He read, there's some beautiful Psalms about praising God, but there are also some Psalms in there where people curse at God where the psalmist is furious at God. There's a professor over at Duke, Ellen Davis, who's a professor of the Psalms and a professor of the Old Testament, who says the Psalms are like the First Amendment of the faithful. They give us the freedom of speech to say to God what it is that we feel. Because the truth of the matter is that God can take it. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We are angry at God and we're frustrated at God for losing whatever it is that we lost. But at least we can still say, my God. My God. The third thing 
that it offers us an invitation to is an invitation to abide in God. William Sloan Coffin is, uh, is, a, is a famous uh, uh, pastor who is pastor of a huge church in, in New York City, Riverside Church, uh, a big famous church in New York. Um, and he was there for a number of years, but he had a fascinating life. He grew up and he was originally a concert pianist at a young age. Then he went to the military and he served as a captain in World War II. Then he got recruited by the CIA and was like a secret agent during the Cold War. And then all of a sudden he went to divinity school. Curveball. Uh, Life goes one way, he went all of a sudden a different direction. And he became the chaplain of Yale for 17 years. And then he got recruited to become the pastor of Riverside Church. While he was at Riverside Church, he experienced something that no parent should experience. His son was killed in a car wreck in Boston. And he had to give the eulogy at his own son's funeral. And he preached on that text, that psalm that says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it was there that he introduced this idea that at the very least, at least we can say, my God. But he also reflected to the congregation the fact that he didn't believe what some people were telling him. He's like Kate Bowler where he had heard all these lies of everything happens for a reason or maybe it's God's will that it just didn't work out or maybe that, you know, you just didn't pray hard enough or maybe it was just a sign of something that you'd done wrong in life. All of these things to justify and to explain away why the loss had occurred, he didn't believe any of it. He said, it wasn't as if God had his hands on my son's car dry, steering wheel when, my, car, when his, my son drove into the Boston Harbor. It's not as, as if God has the, the, his finger on the trigger of every gun during a war. It's not as if God took your plans and just snapped them in half right in front of you. The truth of the matter with God is that life is life. Life happens. And the abiding presence of God doesn't offer us protection in the sense of avoidance, as if you will avoid pain, you will avoid suffering, as if the stormy seas of life don't come your way when you follow Jesus. Life happens, storms happen. But the reality of God is that while God doesn't pr provides minimum protection from the pain and suffering of life, God always provides maximum support in those moments. Jesus responds to Peter when Peter rebukes him by saying, anyone who wants to follow me must take up their cross. Anyone who wants to be a follower of me must take up their cross. In other words, you are going to suffer in life. It's a part of life. Following me doesn't mean that you always live on the sunny side of the street. Following me doesn't always mean that you're going to be happy and joyful and smiley and giggly throughout the days of your life. But following me does mean that I am always with you, no matter where it is you go no matter what it is that you've lost, no matter what dream that doesn't come to fruition or vision that you had for yourself that's been thrown out the window because of the twists and turns in life. And the reality of it is, is that that is good grief. Thank you for listening to The Peak Podcast. Make sure you subscribe wherever podcasts can be found. For more information on how to get connected with our church, please visit us at thepeakchurch.org.